Today what we're going to be talking about are welding symbols. So this is all going to play into how to read a blueprint when you're actually out there in industry and you're performing your duties as a welder. So we're going to cover some things like uh, what do welding symbols uh, mean? What do they consist of? Uh, we're going to go over several examples of how they might look like and then what that translates into as far as the deposited weld. So moving on to the next part, there are five common welding joints. They are T-joint, lap joint, butt joint, corner joint, and edge joint. Everything you do out in industry is going to boil down to some variation of one of these five different welding joints. But the welding symbol is going to give us some extra information like how to prepare the material, if there's any preparation or extra preparation that uh, is involved. It's gonna let us know how we need to um, weld each joint. So it's going to describe things like the size of the weld, uh, how deep we have to penetrate into the material, if there is a specified amount of penetration we need to have, We'll see things like maybe the type of welding electrode we need to use, the type of welding process. And then also other things like, are we going to just chip the weld? Are we going to hammer it? Are we going to grind it? Are we going to machine it? Um, there are a lot of different things that go into a welding symbol, but at its basic foundation, we always start with one of the five welding joints. Now, real quick, before we get any further, I do want to get into a little bit of a terminology thing. So you're going to hear me say weld symbol and you're going to hear me say welding symbol. So there is a difference between the two. The weld symbol is going to be the, the symbol or the icon that describes the basic weld itself. Uh, and then the welding symbol is going to be the weld symbol along with all the other bits of information that are going to go into how we prepare the material, how we weld the material, and then any kind of after weld uh, procedures that need to happen. So one more time, the weld symbol is going to be the shape or the icon that tells us what type of weld we're making, whether that be a groove weld, a fillet weld, a spot weld, anything like that. And then the welding symbol is going to be the weld symbol plus everything else. Here's a snapshot of the reference line from the AWS and all the bits of information that you could find as part of the welding symbol. Now there's a lot to go over here, but we're not going to cover everything in this video. We're going to keep it simple and just the things that you need to know right now that pertain to a fillet weld but feel welcome to pause here, glance over, take a picture for yourself. That way you have something to reference later on. Okay, so if we looked at the last example, we can tell that there are a lot of elements to the welding symbol. Uh, at first, it can be a little intimidating. So let's start basically at step one. Let's start with the foundation or the basis of the welding symbol. And so everything that goes into a welding symbol is going to be written on what's called the reference line. Now the reference line at its most basic form is just a straight horizontal line. Now usually at one end or the other, it's going to break, meaning it's going to change directions. It's either going to point up or it's going to point down. So let's just start this reference line pointing down. Now at the end of this line, there's going to be a filled in arrow point. So this right here is what makes the reference line. Again, a straight horizontal line followed by a break which leads into a second line, 
with a filled in arrow point at the end. Now, there's also a third part to the reference line. This is what's called the tail section. Now, the tail section uh, will always appear opposite of the arrow point. One thing I'll make note of here is that the tail section is actually optional. There are a lot of bits of information that can be turned into a symbol or abbreviated into simple numbers, and that'll be written on the reference line itself. Anything extra that the welder needs to know, like specifically what welding process to use, um, if the welder needs to look at another page to reference notes uh, that will relate to the weld being made, or if, you know, just anything that cannot be abbreviated or drawn as a symbol is gonna be typed in uh, into the tail section. So sometimes you'll see a tail, sometimes you won't. If there are no additional uh, notes that the welder needs to be aware of, then the blueprint, when the blueprint is being created, the tail section will actually be omitted. So you may not see this. You may only see this part of the reference line versus the tail being included. Just something to keep in mind. Now when we get our blueprints and we start seeing reference lines all over the print making up a whole bunch of different welding symbols, you're going to notice a couple different things. You're going to see weld symbols either on top of the reference line or you're going to see them on the bottom of the reference line. Now this does tell us something different about the weld that's to be made because depending on what side the information is included, that's going to, to tell us something unique. So when we look at what's on the bottom, instead of saying the bottom of the reference line, this is actually called arrow side. All right, so one more time, everything that's written underneath or on the bottom side of the reference line is called arrow side. Now everything that's drawn on top of the reference line is called other side. And so other side and arrow side are a breakdown of what's called side significance. So remember how I said earlier, depending on which side the information is drawn on, that's going to tell us something unique about the weld that's to be made. So when we're talking about side significance, here is where I want to introduce the first weld symbol that we're gonna be discussing. It's gonna help us to better understand how arrow side and other side work. So the first symbol I'm going to give us is going to appear as a right triangle. Now, if you have your handout, go ahead and take a moment, pause here, try and see if you can identify what this symbol is. So this symbol is the fillet weld symbol. So like I said, it is essentially a right triangle. Now the symbol for a fillet weld is always going to have that vertical straight leg on the left hand side. So you're always going to see this leg right here on the left hand side. Same thing if it were to be drawn on the other side. You'll always see it on the left hand side. Just like that. All right, but let's only focus on one for right now. Okay, so to help us understand side significance using a fillet weld on the arrow side, I've drawn up just a quick uh, illustration of a T-joint. And this is, you know, you might not see something like this out in industry, but this is more or less how the projects on the blueprint are gonna be drawn in relation with the welding symbols. So the welding symbols are always going to point somewhere along the project that's to be welded. 
this is how we know the weld that's being placed in that or around that location is going to be done however the information on the reference line specifies. So with a filler weld on the arrow side, how do we know where to deposit this weld? So this is actually pretty easy. So when everything is on the arrow side, it's as simple as just following the reference line to wherever it's pointing and wherever it's pointing to on this particular joint is where the weld is going to go. So if we use this example, we follow the reference line all the way down. It's pointing to this side of the T-joint. So this is where the filler weld is going to be deposited. Right in there. Okay, so I'm gonna leave this up here so we have something to compare it to. But what if we have a filler weld symbol on the other side? So on the top of the reference line, how does that work? So we're gonna follow the same principle as if we were looking at a weld symbol on the arrow side. We're gonna follow it down, see which side of the joint is being pointed to but because it's written on other side, we're going to skip over to the opposite side of the joint that the reference line is pointing to. So the reference line is pointing us to this side of the joint, but because the weld symbol is on the other side, we're going to hop over and deposit the fillet weld over here. That's pretty much what side significance is. We have arrow side, other side. Arrow side, you will deposit the weld on the side of the joint that the reference line points to. Other side, you find where the reference line is pointing to and then you skip to the opposite side of that joint. Okay, so here is another example. We have the reference line now flipped going in the other direction. What happens if we come across a welding symbol and the fillet weld is on the bottom? Does this change side significance? So actually it does not. So whether the reference line is pointing to the left, whether it's pointing to the right, up or down, or if there are multiple breaks in the reference line, whatever is written on the bottom or arrow side is always going to be arrow side. Everything that's written up top is always going to be other side. So same principle, we're gonna follow the reference line, see which side of the T-joint is being pointed to, and that's exactly where we're gonna deposit our fillet weld. Now the same goes, of course, again, for anything that's written on the top side, or in this case, other side. We're gonna find which side of the joint is being pointed to, and then we're gonna skip over to the opposite side, and that's where we're going to deposit our fillet weld. All right, before we start moving on to what additional bits of information we can find in a welding symbol that relates to a fillet weld, I think it's important to understand the various elements of a fillet weld. So that way, whatever you're reading on a reference line, you'll be able to identify exactly how the fillet weld needs to be deposited. And so we're going over a fillet weld first because when you're starting out as an entry level welder or you're starting out as a welding student, you, this is the type of work that you're mainly going to be doing. Now, as you work your way up and you start getting into intermediate classes, you'll start going over groove welds because they are much more difficult and that's more than likely what you'll actually be doing in industry. So before we start talking about groove welds, we first need to understand all the various concepts that go into a fillet weld. So I've just got 
a big old T-joint drawn up here with a big fillet weld. And we're gonna start looking at the different elements of a fillet weld. The first part of the fillet weld that I want to go over is called the root. Now I'm pretty sure this is a term that you've heard uh, pretty often. When we start looking at the T-joint, the root is going to be the deepest part of the joint. So this is going to essentially be the deepest point of the weld. So with a T-joint and a fillet joint, the root of your fillet weld is going to be right here. So where the two plates meet and essentially the deepest part of the fillet weld. You can think of this also being as the point uh, on the welding joint that your electrode is going to make contact with when you start your weld, depending on the welding process. So again, the root is the deepest part of the fillet weld where it makes contact with the welding joint. All right, the next element or the next part of the fillet weld that I wanna talk about are the toes of the fillet weld. Every weld is gonna have two toes. You can think of them as the edge of the weld or the area of the weld that transitions into the base metal. So with this particular illustration, the toes of this fillet weld are going to be here and right there. So the two corners or the two edges of the weld where they meet the base metal, not to include the root. So you're gonna have one toe here and you're gonna have the other toe right there. Now the next part of the fillet weld that I wanna talk about are the legs. So same thing with toes, the fillet weld is gonna have two legs. Now the leg of a fillet weld is the length or the distance that the weld extends from the root to either side of the weld. So the leg, again, in, an, in another way to describe it, is the distance between the root of the weld to the toe. So you'll have one leg starting at the root right here, extending all the way to this toe. That's considered one leg. The second leg will start again at the root and extend upward until it gets to this toe. So we have one leg here, one leg there. And it's the length of the weld from the root of the joint or the root of the weld out to the two toes. Okay, I've got a second fillet weld drawn up here because there's a couple more elements and I don't wanna jam pack too much stuff on the one fillet weld. So the next thing I wanna talk about is the face. Now the face is what we see when we're looking directly at the front of the weld. So if we're over here depositing the weld down and we're looking in this angle towards the weld, this right here is the face. So whatever we see on top of the weld, this right here is going to be the face. So you can also call this the surface of the weld. Now there's one more element and this is called the throat. The throat is pretty similar to the legs. It is going to be the distance from the weld root to the face. So the root of the weld is down here. The throat is going to be the distance from the root to the face. Now, it's not necessarily the distance from the root to the face down here or over here. It's basically gonna be the distance to uh, the, the center of the face, which theoretically should be the highest point on the surface. 
Now, when we start looking at additional information on a welding symbol, um, for example, weld size or the size of the weld, this is where we need to know legs, toes, throat, and face. Because a lot of this is going to come together to help us judge whether or not we're making an appropriately sized weld, if it's too big or if it's too small. Okay, so back to the reference line. Now that we understand some of the elements of a fillet weld, we can start talking about the size of the fillet weld, which is more than likely the next piece of information that you'll see written on the reference line. So here I've got a reference line with a fillet weld symbol on the arrow side. And again, I've got a little mock T-joint. So what happens if you see a welding symbol that appears like so, and then you get a number on the left hand side of the fillet weld symbol. Let's say, let's say one half. So anything that's written to the, to the immediate left of the fillet weld symbol is going to tell us the size. The size of the fillet weld will always be written on the left hand side. Now, if you see a fraction like one half, this is telling us one half of an inch. If you see a decimal like 0.5, this is still telling us one half of an inch. The only time the unit of measure changes is if it's actually specified. So if you see something like two and then the abbreviation for millimeters or the symbol for millimeters, then that's when the unit of measure changes. Otherwise, if there's no unit of measure specified, always assume that the measurement is in feet and inches or fractions of an inch. So let's go back to one half. So one half is going to be the size of our fillet weld. So that means when we're depositing our weld, the legs need to extend out from the root one half of an inch. Now, this isn't a perfectly drawn fillet weld, so my apologies, but if this were correctly done, starting at the root of the weld or the root of the joint, this leg should extend out one half of an inch and this leg starting at the root going to the toe should also equal one half of an inch. This is how we determine fillet weld size. Now let's throw in here uh, another example. Let's say we've got a fillet weld on the other side, but instead of one half of an inch, we see something like, uh, let's say three quarters. So there's nothing that follows three quarters. We don't see any symbol for millimeters or centimeters. So we're going to take this as three quarters of an inch. That means the weld that's being done on other side Oh, forgive me, my T-joint wasn't big enough to hold that fillet weld, but we're gonna assume that it's appropriately sized. That means that from the root of the joint, or the root of the weld, this leg is going to extend out to the toe and it's going to equal three quarters of an inch. Same thing with this leg going up the plate. It is going to equal three quarters of an inch. So I did my best to kind of show you that if you have one weld specified at one half of an inch, it's going to be a little bit smaller than the, than the weld that's being called out to three quarters of an inch. One more quick example. If we have a welding symbol, fillet weld, and the size being specified, is 0.125 or in fractions that uh, equals out to one eighth of an inch. 
when we deposit our fillet weld, this leg starting at the root, extending out to the toe is going to equal one eighth of an inch. And then this leg running vertically also starting from the root going up until the toe is going to equal one eighth of an inch. So whatever the size is being specified, think of it as that is the length of the legs for your fillet weld. Okay, so we've established that the size of the weld is always going to be drawn on the left side of the symbol. Now, when we're talking about, you know, if we're welding big assemblies, do our welds need to be the entire length of the joint? Or are we only welding, you know, shorter increments? So if this is something we need to know, how or where do we find it on the welding symbol? So the length of the weld at least with fillet welds, is always going to be drawn on the right hand side. So length is always going to appear right here. Now, if there's nothing specified immediately to the right of the fillet weld, then we can just assume that if we're welding this T-joint, and so just kind of imagine we're looking at a T-joint from the front view instead of the side, our fillet weld is going to essentially start over here and it's going to extend the full length of this T-joint. But if we were to see a number directly to the right of the fillet weld symbol, let's say for example, we see, uh, the number six. Then that pretty much means if we're welding whatever it happens to be, in this case we have a T-joint, the start of our weld all the way to the end of our weld is going to measure six inches. Just the same if we were to, instead of a six, see something like, I don't know, let's say a three, then the start of our weld measuring out to the end of our weld is going to be three inches. So whatever number you see directly to the right of your fillet weld is going to tell you how long your weld needs to be. Okay, now that we've got size and length out of the way, if we are welding fillet welds to a certain length, and let's say they have to be spaced apart, how do we know how far they need to be spaced apart? So this is kind of going under fillet weld spacing. Uh, you can think of these types of welds as uh, stitch welds, but the more appropriate term is intermittent welds. So when you have sections of small welds kind of following in line with each other. So we've got size to the left of the fillet weld symbol, length to the right of the fillet weld symbol. The spacing is what's called pitch. So pitch is going to accompany length being drawn on the right hand side of the fillet weld, but you're always going to see length and pitch together. You're going to see a number for length, so let's say one, and you're gonna see a number for pitch, let's say two, and they're always going to be separated or essentially combined using a hyphen. So if you see something that looks like this, the first number is going to be your length, the second number is going to be your pitch or essentially the spacing between the two welds. So for this example, let's say we've got a welding symbol and we have a length of one, a pitch of two. That means the length of our weld is going to be one inch. So if we get to welding our T-joint, the first weld is going to be one inch in length. So now, how do we determine 
the spacing we need to have in between them before we start depositing our second or our next weld. So it's different than what you might think at first. Some people will probably take this number two and say, okay, if our weld is one inch long, then that means starting at the end of our weld, we're gonna skip forward two inches and start the next weld. But that's actually incorrect. The way that we do this is we're gonna find is we're gonna find the center of our first weld. So if this is one inch long, we're gonna kinda draw a line or we can look at it uh, with an imaginary uh, line if we're out on the job site, we don't have anything to write with. We're going to find the halfway point, or in this case, half of one is a half. So half an inch in, and we're going to then skip forward the two inches. So come this way, two inches, and then we're gonna draw a straight line down. That is going to be the center of our next weld. So when we think of pitch, pitch is the distance from the two welds from the center of the first or the previous weld to the center of the next weld. So real quick, one more time. If our first weld is one inch in length, we're gonna find the middle, which is that half an inch. From there, we're gonna draw a line and then we're gonna skip forward two inches, draw a line straight down. That's gonna be the middle of our next weld. So if we know half of the weld needs to be on this side and half of the weld needs to be on that side, with the length of our weld only being an inch, this means that half an inch is going to go over here and the other half of an inch is going to be on that side. And we'll continue to follow this pattern until we reach the end of our joint. All right, our next example of length and pitch, let's say we have two and five. So a length of two and a pitch of five. So this means our first weld is going to start out on one side of the joint and it's going to extend out two inches. Now we're going to find the middle of this weld so the middle of, of this weld or half of two is gonna be at the one inch mark. So we're gonna measure one inch in. And from there, we're gonna measure out five inches. So measure out five inches, draw a line straight down. This is gonna be the center of your next weld. Now here we have to do a tiny bit of math. If we look back at the welding symbol, we're gonna see that the length of the weld is two inches, right? So half of the weld is going to go on one side of that line that we just drew, and then the other half of the weld is going to go on the opposite side. Well, half of two inches is one inch, so one inch of weld on either side. Now the next thing I want to talk about is changing the appearance of the face of the weld, changing its shape, something that's called weld contour. Now there are three different types of contours and three types of contour symbols. They are flat, convex, and concave. Now whichever symbol you get, they're always going to be placed at the same spot in relation to the weld symbol. So with the filler weld symbol, they're going to be placed right on top. So starting with the first one, the flat contour, this is drawn as just a straight line. And if we ever need to make our welds appear flat, then this symbol is gonna go right above the filler weld symbol like so. So when we get to depositing our filler weld on this T-joint, instead of the face of the weld rounding out away from the weld, it's actually going to just go straight across from one toe to the other. Now, depending on the welding process that you're using in your technique, you could achieve a flat looking weld right off the bat. 
However, if there are any after procedures you need to follow, anything special that you need to do in order to achieve a flat looking weld, there are some other bits of information that you'll see accompanying the contour symbol. You'll see a letter, which is an abbreviation for the process you need to use. Uh, just for example, if you see the letter G on top of a contour symbol, this means that you need to grind the weld in order to achieve that contour. If you happen to see the letter H, this stands for hammering, so you need to hammer the weld in order to achieve this contour. If you see the letter C, this stands for chipping, so you need to chip the weld in order to achieve this contour. And if you see the letter M, that stands for machining, so when you're done welding, you need to machine the weld in order to achieve this weld contour. And you can see any of these uh, letter abbreviations used with any of the contour symbols, whether again that's flat, convex, or concave. Now the next contour symbol we'll be talking about is uh, the convex contour symbol, or some people call this convexity. This is just a simple outward curved line. Some people will say it resembles a half circle or a crescent moon, sort of. Uh, and when we're depositing a fillet weld that's supposed to have some convexity to it, it's going to have this outward curve on the face. So it's going to look like we've got some, some reinforcement in there. Again, there's a buildup, outward curve. And a lot of times we can achieve this just by using um, you know, regular welding technique. And the last contour welding symbol we're going to be talking about is the concave weld symbol or concavity. Now it's going to be just the opposite of convex where convex is an outward curve, concavity is an inward curve. So as we look at the side of a weld that needs to be concave or is concave, it's going to appear like the surface is bending inward towards the root of the joint. All right, so it's gonna look like it might uh, be underfilled, like we didn't put enough uh, reinforcement in there. Now, some of you out there who are familiar with uh, welding already and have some experience in the field, you're probably thinking to yourself, when is it ever going to be ideal to have a concave weld? Uh, you know, isn't that kind of defeating the purpose of structural integrity? So depending on what type of work you're doing and if there's going to be a part that's going to be welded right next to whatever you just welded, you might be kind of tight on room or space for this next part to be welded onto. And so you might have to remove a little bit of that weld material depending on what your tolerances are. So there may be times where you have to remove some weld metal in order to make room for something else. All right, so one more time, the three contour weld symbols that you can come across are flat, convex, and concave. The flat contour symbol is just a straight, flat line. The convex contour symbol is an outward curve, so curving away from the root of the joint. And then the concave weld symbol is an inward curve, or thinking of it as curving in towards the root. And if there are any uh, specific procedures you have to follow or methods to use, uh, those will also be specified by the first letter of the process. So G being grinding, C being chipping, M being machining, H being hammering. And there's actually one other letter that I forgot to, uh, to mention. It's the letter U. Now the letter U stands for unspecified, which basically means do whatever you need to do in order to achieve this contour.